Welcome friends and family to the All Our Voices Showcase. I've been working on this project for a while now, made many changes, and worked with many, many people. I'm so excited to finally be able to share it. All Our Voices is a collection of songs and monologues based off of stories that I received from a couple of students at my middle school. Tonight, we'll hear about Corey Cohen's great-great-grandfather, Bobby Golden's great-grandfather, and my grandmother and great-aunt. I collected these stories early on in the process and looked through them for small moments or what seemed to be a theme. I used these to write both a monologue and a song for each character. Of course, none of these are 100% accurate considering I couldn't speak to most of them and I took some creative liberties. Not only did I receive stories from students, but all the actors are teens as well. Sherman Kim, Bella Cottrell, Bobby Golden, and myself will be bringing these characters to life. I hope to use all our voices as a way to spread awareness about the struggles of immigration both to and in America, but also to celebrate the diversity of culture. CHURLA, the Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights of Los Angeles, is an organization that also works to educate people and to help immigrants. In the description for this video is a link to a GoFundMe where you have the opportunity to donate to CHURLA. But enough talk. Let's get into the show. Once again, I hope you enjoy and are able to walk away knowing more and feeling like there are things you can do to help. Our first story comes from Corey Cohen. Corey's great-great-grandfather, Sam Cohen, fled from Russia in the early 20th century in an effort to evade the persecution of Jews. However, he found that America was not much better. When he crossed the border, he was required to change his last name from Pavelski to Powell, since Pavelski was just too long. He also changed his first name to Sam, and since it is unknown what his first name was originally, he'll go by Isaac. Sam faced many hardships in America, but after weathering them and starting anew once again after changing his last name from Powell to Cohen, he started a business and a family. In this monologue where Isaac Pavelski is played by Sherman Kim, we'll hear about Isaac's internal struggle in starting a life in America and what it means to change his name. I wonder how often the dreams we have actually come true. I thought that in leaving Russia, I would be leaving the hate and the prosecution and the judgment. It scares me to think that if it's in America too, it must be everywhere. The thing is, the judgment and unfair treatment in America is in part focused on smaller things. Strangely, it's losing these things that hold metaphorical value that hurts me more than any blow. I felt like a new man when I got here. A smile white on my face, a little bounce in my step. I could feel the realm of possibility looming ahead. I could almost see it. The tile floors had been cleaned up so impeccably that I could practically see my reflection in them. At first, I let the smell of cleanliness fill my nose, embrace it even. Saw it as proof of a world that wasn't full of grunge and misery and dirt. So it is an effort put into perfection, the good kind of perfection. I was so wrong. I think it began to register when I looked around. There were people there of all ages and races. All these people that had come to escape their home and create a new one. It didn't seem happy though. I pushed it aside, of course, choosing to be optimistic, determined everything was fine. There were these long lines of people, and at the beginning of each were the men who worked at the border of the new life and couldn't wait to start. At that moment, they all seemed like friends to me. I didn't know them, had no connection to them, and they didn't see me any differently than the thousands of other faces they saw daily. But when I finally reached the front of the line, I was absolutely gleeful. That man took one look at my face and smirked at me with cold eyes. I remember feeling my smile falter, that spark letting free all those nagging doubts into my mind. Suddenly, the cleanliness of the room was unsettling, threatening almost, as though they were showing the power they held, as if they were saying, we're better than you. The floors were kept so clean because America didn't want us there. We thought we were leaving behind a world of grunge and misery and dirt, but to them, we were bringing it with us. The man looked at me with those cold eyes, observing as my mentality switched. He asked for my name. Despite my realization, I felt my chest swell with pride. Isaac Pavelski, the one thing that felt familiar. He sighed, and my heart dropped to my chest. 
It was too long, he said. It wasn't practical. It wasn't right. So that Pavelski wasn't getting a visa. But I had to get in. No matter how horrible and hopeless it seemed here, it had to be better than inside the borders. It had to. If it wasn't, my whole journey would have been for nothing. I left familiarity behind. I left my culture. I left my family. And for what? To face the same hate that I had before, but to be stripped of everything devoid of hate? To trade in bad for worse? It was that little shred of hope and that chip on my shoulder that had me asking what he meant. He said that in order to get a visa, I needed to change my name. And for some reason that knocked the breath out of me, more than the prospect of an unkind, unforgiving society. My name was who I was, my identity, my past. But what was my past? Fleeing from prosecution? Running because of who I was? Because of who I worshipped? Not because I had done something wrong or hurt someone, but because I was different. For just a split second, I wanted to change my name wholeheartedly. I already wanted to start anew. Why not really become a new person? But the idea of not being me really hit. If I changed my name, forgot my culture, then was I really helping myself? Was I finding a place to be successful and to be loved for who I was? Or was I using the new place as an excuse to blend in with the norm? To take advantage of a culture that was more than happy to change my identity so I fit better with who they wanted? Maybe there was good path of order. Maybe this was a sacrifice I had to make in order to have a better life. America wasn't as accepting as I'd hoped, but it was better than Russia. It was better than what I was running from. It had to be. I needed it to be. I still don't know all that's out there. The extent of the bad, of the good. I hope for a better world. To start my own business, get married, start a family. Help change the way people saw me, saw others who are different, no matter how small the change was. I just couldn't help the nagging thought. I still can't. That no matter what I did, who I brought to my side, I'd still be betraying myself. But on the other hand, it seemed like my only chance. There was one thought running through my head, unrivaled, as I sit on those cold, breathtakingly clean tiles. As the clock ticked, and that man stared at me with cold, unmoving eyes, his foot tapping impatiently on the floor. If I changed my name, Isaac Pavelski wouldn't be finding freedom. Ian Powell would. And Ian Powell did. A sea of happy people A world where I can be what I want Is what I thought that I would find But Pavelski isn't Powell and it's not Anticipation. I remember being rid of the blues I thought they would really see me But Pavelski isn't Powell, they just saw it too find my place not a thing I did would suffice I would lose every race my progress still lies I will always stand out my name is just
like a shout Saying I don't belong, I don't belong I changed my name So they would see me as one of the same I stripped away my identity Now Pavelski is a trowel I'm no longer me It's just the name it represents Why I came in America Take that away I came so I could pray To who I want each day And yet it all feels so strange They don't see me as me when it's my name They can't read so they judge me That I had to change There was a price to pay Now Pavelski isn't my name I'll sit alone each night Just to find my flight over fun And not think about what I gave away I know all but one fact And it's exactly that With my name I won I will always stand out My name is just like a shout Saying I don't belong I don't belong Did I do what was right? I barely tried to fight I'm doing fine now cause I put my head down Will I always stand out? Feeling out of place I know something is wrong and it will be The second story is about Bobby Golden's great-grandfather, Jack. Jack grew up in Poland in the early 20th century, and like Sam, he was met with a lot of anti-Semitism. The whole village was against their family and the other Jews. There was never anything they could do to combat this hatred, as they were outnumbered. Every morning, Jack would go to get water for the whole family, and on the walk back, boys from the village would throw manure into the bucket and ruin the water. This happened for years, and one day, Jack was so fed up with it that he hit one of the boys with the bucket. This was a catalyst for a series of events that left Jack and his younger brother, the two oldest children in their family, alone in Poland, while the rest of the family fled to America. By some crazy luck, they were able to find money under a park bench, which provided just enough for both of them to get a boat ride to America. Bobby will be playing her grandfather, who has been adapted to a girl character, Lena. Her brother will be known as Adrian. Lena has been thrust into the role of a parental figure who now needs to provide for her brother. They are without food for days until Lena begins singing for the richer folks on the upper deck. They throw money down and Lena is able to feed herself and her brother. We're not thriving. We're surviving. But what about when surviving is not enough? I don't think I ever expected to be here right now. On a boat, alone, 
suddenly assuming the role of a parent. And it's not because I'm responsible. It's not because I'm trusted to hold the life of another human being in my hands. And it's not because I was elected to do it because it gives me pride to have power to be respected. I'm doing it because of hate. Because we must already be dead, for no life is this hellish. And whatever I did in life, in the past, to influence this, to cause this, to make a young girl, barely a teen, the parent of her younger brother, must have been horrible. The thing is, as horrible as it is, I'm not surprised. My life has always been miserable. Wondering if I'll get my next meal, if I'll be beaten up in the streets, have clouded my thoughts long as I can remember. I like to think that there are places where life is better, where people aren't prosecuted because of who they worshipped or scapegoated or hated. I wonder if those people do exist, if they think that because this is all I've ever known, I think it's normal, I'm content with it. Treat it as normality, that this is just life. They'd have to be stupid to think that a human could live in those conditions and think that was just how life was supposed to be. And if they did think that we just sat here in our ignorance, then, then they, they left us too. Let us live through decades of misery and do nothing about it sit there in their nicely furnished homes and think, thank God that's not me. They won't make an effort to stop it unless it hurts them. It disgusts me. All of humanity does. It makes you wonder, why make an effort to survive if you don't thrive? Why live a miserable life? I think we keep on going because humans are just creatures of hope. We'll hang on to anything we can just to keep us from going under. Just like how I'm hanging on to the shred of hope that America is good. That they have a reason to ignore us and our problems. I feel like I'm in a nightmare and all I want to do is wake up. Poland seems so far away now. My family does. Part of me resents them for leaving me and Adrian here alone. I wish they hadn't let us kids go, that they would have stayed behind. And yet, I wonder, is that what I would have done? Would we even have been able to survive? If it was just us kids, probably not. So I guess it made more sense to save a few of us. They could have left us with something though. I feared that the money we found that got us on this boat is the last of our luck. It's cruel in a way. We were given just enough to start our voyage, to go where our family is, but not enough to sustain ourselves. We don't have money for food or for water. Adrian told me he was hungry. I don't think he realizes what's happened, why we can't eat or drink, why we haven't seen the rest of our family in days. Part of me wishes I was as naive as him that I could have a few more days of not knowing what had happened. The other part of me is glad that I'm not because I won't be let down. The way I felt when they told me Adrian wasn't gonna go with them, I wanted to scream and shout and hold on to them so tight they'd have to take me with them. But then I thought, well, the only reason we have to leave is because of me. <laughs> because I couldn't control my temper, because I'm weak. For years, they'd torment me. Every day, I'd walk miles to fill our water. My feet aching, my back sore from the weight. I'd wake up early in the morning while it was still dark. I remember the sun would always rise as I'd walk back and the boys in the village had risen. They were always waiting for me. Always, with a sneer on their face, that cold, unforgiving glares and judgment. Hatred, the, the direct result of their parents feeding them lies about us, telling them that Jews were evil. 
It was what caused the pogroms. But these boys were so young. My age, maybe a little older. Too young to carry such a hatred. They didn't realize it though. They never realized what they were really doing. Each day when they'd tip the water, I'd so carefully and arduously collected with manner. It was stupid of me to hope that one day they wouldn't be there. So stupid. And then I remember when I cracked. For that split second, it felt so good to hit him. There was such a resounding and satisfying crack when the bucket collided with his head. Such revenge. And for a moment, I felt good. Adrenaline coursing through my veins. And then I heard him crying. And as quickly as I had felt good, the dread filled me. I remember blinking as I snapped back to reality. Though it was almost like just falling into a nightmare. And then we fled. I don't think I know what it is to thrive. I've always just survived. Hung onto that ledge by my fingertips. Grasped for the last bit of twine on the rope. And for the most part, I guess I've come out unscathed, at least physically. When something especially bad is happening, I like to think of my future self. Happy, content, safe. I like to think about how she'll look back at me and smile, knowing that everything is okay. Unfortunately, the only way I can hope there even will be a future self is if the present me gets something to eat. We don't have any money. I don't think there's any work I can do in the kitchens. I've tried begging the people on our level and they won't let us up to where the richer folk are. But there is a balcony. Maybe it's time to make an effort to thrive. The water's awfully blue today The color's surprising I didn't think it could be pretty when death is so near. I'm only 13, got so many years to live. Decades ahead of me, but only if I don't quit. You can 
can all be carefree. People down here are hungry. Here is the reality. If you don't tell me, I'll die. shine I've got no parents now I'm on my own I'm living without a home I'm only 13 got so many years to live decades ahead of me but The final two stories will be loosely based on my grandma, Manas, who will be known as Parisa, and my great aunt, Homa, who will be known as Esther. The sisters grew up in Iran, surrounded by family and culture. When Parisa married Cass, they moved to America so Cass could pursue his dream of being a specialty doctor. Not long after they moved, the Iranian revolution began and Esther was trapped in Iran. They were separated for four years before Esther decided to make an attempt to escape. From Bella Cottrell, we'll hear about Parisa's life in America and the struggle she has in fitting in and feeling at home. I will play Esther, who has a moral struggle once she realizes someone who helped her cross the borders stole her passport. The majority of these two stories are fictionalized, so I could better represent various struggles that were touched upon very briefly in these women's lives. Two negatives make a positive, right? If you subtract a negative, you're adding. And if you multiply two negative numbers, you'll get a positive one. Two no's also make a yes. If you say no to no, you're saying yes. If you say don't, don't steal, you're saying don't not steal. You're saying steal. They say two wrongs don't make a right, but I don't understand why. Because two negatives make a positive and two no's make a yes. It used to be an eye for an eye. In ancient Greece, if someone killed your father, you had every right to kill theirs. That sounds fair. I don't understand why. If something takes something important from you that you can't take something back or take something from someone else. I'm the victim. Why is it unfair to me? Why can't everyone just be good? I know it's naive. Silly, really. But am I not allowed to hope for good in the world? Though, to be honest, do I even want good? Whatever that is? Because it seems to me that being good is cheating me out of all my dreams. In every book I have read, the good guys, the heroes, the protectors, the saviors, they always win. And they always do it by treading lightly, caring about the weak, and doing everything they can in an ethical manner. And the bad guys don't. And yet, they never win. Being good puts you at a disadvantage. It's harder to achieve your goals when you're not only caring about yourself. The villains don't care about the weak. They don't care about helping people or keeping civilians safe. All they care about is their goal and the quickest way to achieve it. So how do they always lose? Society says, be good, treat others how you'd want to be treated, look for ways you can improve the world, put others before yourself. They say if you're good and kind and caring and helping that it'll come back, that someone else will lend you a hand, do you a favor, but they don't, they never do. They've tricked us into being good people, into quietly following these rules and not questioning anything into not retaliating when someone ruins your life.
but somewhere the masterminds behind this, they're evil, villains, bad guys, anarchists. They tell us that two wrongs don't make a right, so we don't go after their friends who do us wrong. You never expect the people who are bad to be bad. The man at the fruit stand was old, his hair graying and his fingers wrinkled. He moved slowly through his goods to get me what I wanted, hunched over, holding his back as he walked. But he wore a delightful smile that seemed to have reached his eyes. I see now that was all a semblance of goodness. He knew a man, Azimuth, who had two camels, who could help me reach my destination for a price, who could help me out of Iran. I had the money, I paid in full, and I put my trust in these seemingly kind men. But now my mother's jewelry is gone. My extra clothes, my remaining money, my passport. Now I have nothing because I trusted someone. This kind family took me in, allowed me to sleep in their bed and eat their food, allowed me to escape from my journey, gave me everything I could possibly need to continue, but I can't continue because I lost everything. And all too conveniently, in the room that they let me sleep in is money and a passport. The wife looks similar to me, similar enough that I could pass as her. They are happy, they are content where they are, but for me, that is all still so far. They don't need it, I do. Yet now, because I am supposed to be good, I cannot do anything. It is simply not right for me to take from someone else, to replenish what I have lost. It is not good. But why not? People who are good are never more successful than people who are bad. People who are bad trick others, push people down and cheat, but they get to that finish line far faster than the rest of us do. Why can't I do that? Why can I steal someone else's money and clothes and passport to further myself? I lost everything. I did nothing wrong and I lost everything. How is that fair? Why don't I get damage control? Why don't I get to take back what I deserve? What was mine? Two negatives make a positive. Two no's make a yes. If you are wrong about being wrong, you are right. So two wrongs do indeed make a right. Does that even make sense? And does it making sense matter? A hero would care, but a villain wouldn't. A villain would get back what they lost. A hero would sit in sadness and shame and do nothing about it. They blame themselves. I will not blame myself. This was not my fault. I did nothing to deserve it. Villains believe what they believe wholeheartedly while heroes think they are wrong. And maybe they are, but they are ignorant and they don't care. I believe that two wrongs do and will make a right. It's time for me to start getting ahead in this world. I can't believe this after all those days of traveling. My hope is listless and gone. I'm realizing now what it was. I wish I had known before because the world is I've been played as a fool. He took the passports when I didn't know. Then he pushed me as far as I could go. So now I'm stuck with just bad luck to my name. Because I'm drowning. I can't catch my breath, I'm fighting, but I'm dancing with death, and no matter how hard I try, it gets me time after time. I can't believe him, I know we have both been trying, but hello, I'm still 
Where is the man I fell for? I know it's not him behind the door. We're all allowed to reach for the stars, but you had to set your sights on Mars. I know he wanted to study people's bones, but he forgot us. About the sticks and stones, I guess part of me just feels betrayed because I'm drowning and I can't catch my breath. I'm fighting, but I'm dancing with death, and no matter how hard I try. I just can't seem to deny it. So I'll rise and try to realize something new, something true to help me through. Because the hardest thing to do is step away. And let the wind blow you to start a brand new tale. So don't fall and don't fail. And, and if, if you're, you're in the water, don't flail because even. Despair is stronger and the water is whirling and it brings you down. You have to fight for yourself. You have to do what's right at your core. And if something comes your way, something tough that makes you sad. Enjoyed the stories and were able to gain perspective into these struggles. There are so many people who helped me so much in this process. First and foremost, my mentor Jonah, who gave me feedback on all my work and showed me how to make my work the best I could. Then to the Julie Baron Platt Teen Innovation Grant, which provided funds and so many helpful lessons for my project. Thank you to the actors and those who submitted stories. It was all incredible. Once again, there is a link to the Churla GoFundMe in the video description. If you are able to donate, it would mean so much to me and will go to an organization that is doing so much to help people. Thanks again for watching and have a wonderful night. Bye!